you turn in your Bibles to the book of Hebrews this morning. We're going to be kicking off a series that we've entitled Jesus, the greatest of all time. And we're going to be looking at the New Testament book of Hebrews. And this New Testament book was dedicated uh, to a group of individuals who were needing encouragement. They were needing an exhortation. They were needing, in some ways, a kick in the pants that would move them to endure, that would move them to persevere. And the reason why these Hebrew first century Christians needed that kind of exhortation was that life as followers of Christ were difficult for them. They were experiencing persecution and trouble. Their family and friends did not want to associate with them. They had lost property. They had lost promotion. And as a result of that, these first century Hebrew Christians were thinking about giving up and giving in. And so this author, who we don't know who it is, it's the only anonymous book in all of Scripture. Now, there's a lot of speculation. Is it the Apostle Paul? Is it Apollos? Could it be Barnabas? Could it be even Priscilla? These wonderful men and women of the faith in the New Testament? We don't know. But what we do know is that the desire of the author is to make much of Jesus. And that is what we are going to do again and again and again. And the recipe or the uh, picture of success for a follower of Jesus Christ who's dealing with difficult days around them, and I think we can all amen that today, for the antidote for the Christian who feels like a minority in their workplace or their school, uh, the pathway to success for a Christian who feels like following Christ isn't maybe the best approach to living life in this world, the writer of Hebrews calls us to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And so that's what we are going to do in these days to come. Now, a couple things I want to highlight before we get into our text this morning. First of all, this book, this letter that was written to the Hebrew Christians of the first century is 13 chapters long. It was one long written sermon. So if you think my sermons are long, just listen to the whole reading of the book of Hebrews, and that is a sermon that goes on for some time. But amidst those 13 chapters are two truths. First of all, while we don't know who the author is, we know a couple things about them. First of all, they are a scholar when it comes to the Old Testament scriptures. What you're going to see over and over and over again is this writer highlighting what they know, the extensive knowledge of the Old Testament scriptures. Now, this is really important because it helps us to recognize the scriptures that the New Testament church was dealing with. They used the Old Testament as their scriptures, as the writing of the New Testament was coming into play. But even more than that, this writer loved Judaism. This writer loved the festivals. They loved the sacrifices. They loved the rituals that came with the Jewish faith. But what they're going to say is they loved something way greater. And that was they loved Jesus Christ. And the greater love that they had was for Christ and his work and his finished sacrifice on the cross of Calvary. And he wants to exalt above all other things Jesus as the greatest of all time. Now, as we approach this book, we need to recognize this isn't an easy book. In fact, it was said of one of the commentaries that I was reading that this is the most far-off book for the 21st century Christian. What, what is meant by that is we are far away from the life and times of, what this was being, of who this was being written to. Now, you could say that because 2,000 years and half a globe span all of the writings of Scripture to the 21st century American Christian. But because it was written primarily to a Jewish audience, much of what we're going to read about, the illustrations that are given, some of the festivals and some of the rituals that were done, they're going to kind of go over our head as Gentiles in the 21st century. So there will be times where we'll be intimidated, where we'll feel this task of going through this book verse by verse will be daunting. But I want to remind you that the reason why all of this is done is so that we would see Jesus more clearly. And the application of seeing Jesus more clearly for who he is 
and for what he has done is so that when the going gets tough, when everybody seems to be against you, when life is one disappointment after another, as life seems to cave in, when we look up at Jesus, we can have confidence, joy, and endurance that we are on the right road, that we are on the right path, and that in the end, the one who saved us in the beginning will be faithful to see us to the end, amen? And so that's where we wanna go with this morning, and we're gonna do so under the best heading of a sermon series, Jesus, the greatest of all time. Now that word or phrase, greatest of all time, has really come into the sports vernacular. Uh, it, it literally now is just the GOAT. Who's the GOAT? That is an acronym for greatest of all time. And if you're a sports fan, you no doubt have been a part of these arguments about a particular sport where you say with it's basketball or football or baseball, this individual is the best there's ever been. There is no competition, there's no rival based on their statistics, based on their ability and their, their playing career. They are the best of all time. Now, many times, those arguments are very futile. A lot of people have opinions and a lot of people have thoughts. Many people say this is the wrong conversation to have. What we should do is in every sport we should have a Mount Rushmore, a, a handful of individuals who make it on the mountain as being the best of a particular sport. But we're Americans, we like to argue with one another and we want to know who is best. And so Complex Magazine recently, about a year and a half ago, said they wanted to settle all debates. They wanted to address once and for all in the major sports who is the greatest of all time. They looked at two things. They first looked at human reasoning, and then they put an algorithm together. I don't even know how to spell that. But an algorithm together to put together the stats that would once and for all say who is the greatest of all time. Now, we're going to look at seven different sports for a moment, okay? And this is, I want to engage you in this process. I want to see where you think someone should be. And so let's deal with them. And as we do, as we're going to pull these things up, they said this, our task is simple. We are going to make the case why so-and-so deserves GOAT status, and we're going to make no apologies for our choice, we're going to let you fight over our selections, but we're confident that these individuals have proven themselves to be above and beyond anyone else in their respective sports. So here we go. You ready? We're going to start with the sport of basketball. Give me some names of the greatest of all time. Okay, Jordan, Kobe. Hey, quiet down in the front row, all right? If you're not using the word Jordan, don't. We're in Chicago, man. All right, so Kobe, Jordan, anyone else? Jordan, we got Jordan already, okay. All right, LeBron, LeBron, LeBron. All right, okay, drum roll please. The greatest of all time, Michael Jordan, yay! All right, all right, let's move to baseball. Don't put it up yet. Baseball, throw some names to me. Only Cubs, only Cubs. Carlton Fisk. Listen. Major League Baseball, Major League Baseball. All right, drum roll. Brrr. Babe Ruth is the answer, okay? All right, let's move on because I got to preach from the Bible this morning. Tennis, tennis, any names? Nobody's like, who plays tennis? Okay, I heard it, Serena Williams, okay? Wow, you guys sound like an angry mob, okay? How about football? Football. I still haven't heard the answer. The answer is Joe Montana. Oh, back off, people. Okay. How about boxing? How about boxing? Wait a minute. Time out. Everyone, time out. Time out. I heard Rocky. Okay. Of course we know it was Apollo Creed, right? The answer is Muhammad Ali. All right. All right. We've got just a couple more here. Uh, soccer. The answer by Americans, what is soccer, right? You're, everybody only knows one soccer player. 
That's why he's the best. The answer is Pele. Pele is the soccer player. And wouldn't you know it, Complex Magazine put an algorithm together on who the best WWF wrestler was. Okay? All right, so throw me some names. Hogan, Andre the Giant. No, I still haven't heard it. Nope, still haven't heard it. Here we go. You ready? The final one. Okay. Elwood, I got you. You know you watch wrestling. Man, he got it. I've never seen John Elwood this excited for church. Bruce Lee. <laughs> Unbelievable. The answer is the nature boy, Ric Flair. Okay, so let's take a moment real quick. How many liked the list? Give me a thumbs up if you liked it. How many didn't like it? How many don't care? All right. Yeah, what sport? They still play that? All right, okay, we're breaking into a Pentecostal service here. We're gonna go back to Baptist now. That's where I do the talking and you do the listening, all right? So here's what I read in the article. So let's bring it back to where we're at. We want to know who the greatest of all time is. Listen to what Complex Magazine closes the argument or the article with. In case of each of these, we should all bow down to these gods living among us mere mortals. Now let's stop here. You see, when we start talking about the greatest of all time, what we are beginning to do is we're beginning to say there's a transcendence and otherness to those individuals. Now here, I'm a huge sports fan, and I love many of these individuals and got to watch them hone their craft and destroy their competition. But listen to me, the name, the title, of greatest of all time, lands on the shoulders of one individual, and that individual is Jesus Christ, our Lord. You see, with Jesus, there are no contenders. There are no equals. There are no runners up. He is the dynasty of dynasties, and that is, listen, as difficult as a book of Hebrews is to study and, and to understand and to apply, if you get that this book of Hebrews is about Jesus being the greatest of all time, then you're going to understand where this book is going. Because what this book is going to say is Jesus is greater than the patriarchs, Jesus is greater than the prophets, Jesus is greater than uh, any of the law and all of its requirements. Jesus first, last, he is our everything, and that's what we want to learn through this letter. So look at this text in front of us, Hebrews 1, 1 through 4. Right from the get-go, the writer begins to gush about who Jesus is. Now sadly, in our world, of which we're going to learn Jesus created by the power of his word, there are individuals in our world who have all manner of opinions about Jesus. British singer Elton John says this about our Lord and Savior. Jesus was a compassionate super intelligent gay man who understood human problems. Atheist Christopher Hitchens said, all Jesus is is a fanciful Santa Claus for adults. Listen, we could spend a lot of time listening to the opinion of fools, but I would rather hear from God's own word of what God has to say about who Jesus is. And that blasphemy, that drivel, of fools has no place in the house of God. And what God's word says is that Jesus is in fact the greatest of all time because God fully and finally speaks through him, he exclusively saves through him, and he powerfully sustains all things through Jesus. That's where we're going this morning. So let's look at Hebrews chapter one, verses one through four. It says this, long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. He's the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. It's Jesus who upholds the universe by the power of his word. 
After making purification for sins, Jesus sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, and having become as much superior to, the, to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. One of the things you're going to see in our study of Hebrews is the word more superior, better, or greater based on your Bible translation. Thirteen times that word is going to come out. Jesus is greater than all these things. Let's notice how the writer of Hebrews opens up. Number one, he says that it is God saying that Jesus is the greatest because he fully and finally speaks through Jesus. Now, I love in verse 1 how the book starts. The book doesn't start with Jesus' earthly ministry. It doesn't start with the Palm Sunday parade. It doesn't start with the crucifixion or the resurrection or the ascension. Where it begins is in the beginning. Long ago, in many times, in many ways, God. Your and my worldview as followers of Christ always must begin and end with God. Because if we do not have God as our foundation, if history and our comings and goings don't find their place with God, we will create a leaning tower of Pisa of a faith. It won't stand straight. And so the author says right away, God is in the beginning. We see that in the book of Genesis. We see that in the gospel of John. But notice what it says. Not only is God in the beginning, but notice the phrase there. It might be good for you to underline if you do that in your Bible. In many times and in many ways, God spoke. Now, we run by that word so very quickly, but that phrase, God spoke, speaks volumes to who we are and what we need to recognize as followers of Christ. First of all, we need to recognize that God is not some far-off, distant creator who put this world in order and then left it by the wayside. God is intrinsically involved in it. Last night at the marriage night, we were listening to one of the speakers, and, and one of the speakers said, communication is the core of all interaction as a married couple. It's true for all relationships. We need to communicate. And the most important relationship that we have is between us and God, and our God communicates with us. Now, there's a couple ways that he communicates. We see that he communicates through creation. How awesome over these last weeks we've been able to worship outside and and enjoy God's creation as we've worshiped and sang praises to him. God's creation tells us that he's a God of power and of order, a God that is right on time and utterly faithful with the seasons. But God's creation doesn't tell us everything. But then we have this still small voice in us, the scripture says, that our conscience speaks to us. It cries out to us when we sin. It calls us to repentance and confession. And yet, there are things that our conscience doesn't tell us. And so notice the writer of Hebrews, not addressing those, he begins to talk about how God has most fully spoken. And he starts with the Torah. Now this is important for uh, these Hebrew Christians because they had loved the Torah. For most of them, they had memorized the Torah. They understood the reason for the Torah because it was through the Torah that these Hebrew Christians knew who God was. And second, they knew what God wanted or expected from them. And third, what God's plans and purposes were going to be. And so here are God's people. They want to know who their, who their God is. The Torah would tell them that. Next, they wanted to know uh, what God required of them. So if God had created them and he had a law for them and they wanted to abide by that law, and then the question was, God, what are you doing in the future? And the Old Testament scriptures walked through that. Now notice how that word came through in many times and many ways. Over the course of hundreds of years, the Torah would be written. Generation upon generation upon generation, God was speaking. There wasn't just one generation where God spoke to his people, but faithfully, each and every generation heard a voice from the Lord. And they were thankful for that at times, and other times they rebelled against it. Notice in many ways, God spoke through men. God spoke through women. 
God spoke through old people. God spoke through children. God spoke through animals. God spoke through a writing on the wall. God spoke through all manner of things. He spoke through faithful prophets. He spoke through rebellious prophets. He spoke through uh, the Israelites. He also spoke through the Assyrians and the Babylonians and other uh, nations that didn't even follow God through many times and in many ways. The many ways that he did it, he spoke through the law. He spoke through history. He spoke through biographies of people's lives. He spoke through songs. He spoke through wisdom. He spoke through prophecy. Now, all of these different ways and all of these different times, I want you to get in your mind what God is doing. What God did when creation was brought into existence and when man was brought into the world, God took a uh, jigsaw puzzle of pieces and he dumped it onto uh, a, a table. And what he began to do is he used prophets to take pieces and to start putting them together. Okay, does that make sense? He's putting them together. And little by little, the picture started to partly come into focus. Like you, as you put a jigsaw puzzle together, maybe you get the outline. Maybe you're one of those that gets the outline done. You're like, okay, at least I know the boundaries of the puzzle. Or maybe you get a part and see a face or a a certain uh, picture of, of something. You're like, okay, now I know a little bit more of what the puzzle looks like. The Old Testament, listen, this is very important. The Old Testament prophesied in part, not in whole. And so there are times in Scripture where as New Testament Christians, we go in with the whole view. We know how the story ends. But the Old Testament saints didn't. So when Adam and Eve are sitting in the garden, and God says that there's going to be an offspring of the woman... And the woman, or the, the offspring of the woman, will crush Satan's head, but Satan will strike his heel. Have you ever thought what Adam and Eve must have thought? What are you talking about, God? And I wonder if they went to, well, surely that's going to be Cain or Abel. That's, that's our offspring. And little did they know from Genesis 3.15 that God is foreshadowing Jesus. Little do we know that when uh, uh, King David is talking about uh, this servant that's going to be uh, beaten down and forsaken by God, I wonder if many who read the Psalms after David had passed, if they were like, he's talking about himself. Little did they know he was talking about one that was going to come. Little did the city of Bethlehem really know what it meant when in Micah, it said, O little town of Bethlehem, though you are small amongst the tribes of Israel, out of you is going to come something. I bet you they didn't fully understand what it was. Why? Because it was in part. When they heard the story of Jonah and the whale, little would they know that not only was Jonah in the belly of the great fish for three days, but later on, a greater prophet, the Son of God, was going to be in the grave for three days and then be resurrected from the dead. You see, the Old Testament is partial. But it's not only partial, and this is important that you recognize, it's progressive. And what that means is, as the Old Testament went along, more and more of the picture of the puzzle came into view. And so, little by little, and so what does that mean? David knew more about God than Moses did. Moses knew more about God than Abraham did. Uh, the prophets that came after uh, David knew more about God than David did. Why? Because they were able to build on what they had already known from the former generations, and now they are able to speak what God is saying, saying, oh, here's another part of the puzzle. I understand the picture a little more. That's why we are so blessed, because you may say, well, I wish I would have been during those times and seen some of that stuff. The Bible says, more blessed are we, because we have the whole picture. We know the rest, Paul, uh, Paul Harvey says, the rest of the story. Now, why are we blessed? There's one reason, and that reason is Jesus Christ. Jesus fully and finally spoke what was revealed about God. Now, what the author says is that this Jesus is not just like one of the prophets. See, that's what Islam says. Islam says that Jesus is just in the line of the other prophets. That is a mockery of who Jesus is. 
Jesus is more than just in the line of another prophet. And so what do we learn about this? First of all, we see in these last days, Jesus came. G. Campbell Morgan put it this way. He said, when God spoke to men in Jesus Christ, God said everything he had to say, which means God said everything that men need to hear. Listen to me very carefully. When we look deeply into the life and ministry and person of Jesus Christ, we don't need to look anywhere else. We don't need to go anywhere else. Up the street, there's a church that's dedicated itself to a prophet named Joseph Smith who brought another testimony of God. We don't need another testimony from God. We have Jesus Christ, the first, the last, and the greatest. And so what do we need to know about this Jesus? Notice he says a couple of things. I want to focus on two phrases in the text. First of all, he's the radiance of the glory of God. And then I want to look at the exact imprint of his nature. What we need to recognize is when Jesus came, he made God visible. When Jesus came, he put God, he put flesh on God. It's what the book of Colossians says, that the totality of the deity uh, uh, is in bodily form. Jesus shares this radiance. Now, when they hear the radiance of the glory, again, you and I hear that and we just move on. What the Israelites, what the Hebrew Christians would have heard when they read this, they would have seen the radiance of God's Shekinah. Shekinah was the glory of God. It was the aura. It was the rays that emanated from God. And the best place we have this is when Moses is on Mount Sinai. And God comes and and he walks before Moses. And Moses gets a glimpse of the Shekinah of God. But he only gets a glimpse because it isn't God says, you can't take my Shekinah. And so I'm going to push you into a a little sliver of the rock so you're hidden. There's this little deflection there. I'm going to put some glasses on you so you don't get the full extent. And so when I pass by, I'm going to give you a glimpse from the backside of me uh, because it's not maybe not as brilliant because I blind you with it. And so what happens when Moses comes off of Sinai? He is brilliant, white as snow. People have difficulty gazing upon him. They're afraid of him. Why? Because he had experienced the radiance of the glory of God. Brothers and sisters, we're way better than Moses because we haven't just experienced the backside of the glory of God. We look deeply into the eyes of the radiance of the glory of God when we look in the eyes of Jesus. And so we get to see this presence of God that even the Old Testament saints like Moses were unable to see. But notice it goes on. He's the exact imprint. The idea there is the idea of a a king taking his signet ring and putting it into wax to seal a letter. And when he would do that, the imprint that was made by the ring into the wax was the exact representation of what the ring was. There was no defection from it. What this tells us is this Jesus is God. We learn that in the book of John, of course. And what we understand is, is he is the same. Ontologically, in his being, he is the same. Now, as a father of three sons, I have three sons who are striking resemblances of their old man, hopefully the good resemblances. But they aren't the exact imprint. And so when we talk about Jesus being the son of God, we think, well, Jesus is a chip off the old block. No, listen, brothers and sisters, he is the exact imprint of our God in heaven. Now, that is why Jesus said, when you see me, you see the Father. And so what we need to be doing is looking deeply into who Jesus is. Jesus is the one whom God has finally and fully spoken through. That's why he's the greatest. But notice the second one. And the second one is, is that God the Father says he's the greatest because he exclusively saves through Jesus. He exclusively saves through Jesus. Not only do we see God and hear from God most fully in Jesus, but it's through Jesus that we are saved. 
In John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And in that statement, it's the most exclusive statement uttered by anyone in the world. People say, I like the inclusive Jesus. Jesus was nothing about inclusion. Jesus was fully exclusive. You've got to come through me. A prophet could say, you need to listen to my words and I will show you the way. That's again the affront we have with Islam. Jesus is not one who points to the way. Jesus is the way. And so what we need to recognize is not only is Jesus the way, but he made the way. There was no way before Jesus. It was Jesus who made the way where there was no way for sinful humanity to enter into a right relationship with God. Chuck Sundahl put it this way. He said, the first Adam who undid humanity by his disobedience, plunging the world into darkness, death, sin, and suffering. But the last Adam, Jesus Christ, through his voluntary suffering and death on the cross, drove out the darkness, banished death. We who had been poisoned by sin are now cured by the blood of Christ forever, once for all, never to be repeated. The book of Hebrews is going to say, no human being can do that. No prophet can do that. No angel can do that. Only Jesus Christ can accomplish this. Now, time out. And let's take a moment and dig dig deeply into this. This Jesus, who created the world, who we're going to see in a moment upholds the universe by the power of his word, this Jesus, who is the Shekinah glory of the Father in heaven, This Jesus, who is the exact imprint of the nature of God, what did this Jesus do? He came to earth. He left heaven and all it afforded, and he came to earth, and he put on flesh, and he lived within the constraints of space and time. He was birthed and had to learn from sinful mom and dad. He ate with us. He played with us. He learned with us. In his later life, he taught us. He healed us. He ministered to us. And he did all of that while a world around him, the world he came to save, mocked him, abused him, scoffed at him, mistreated him. When we got to the fullness of our anger, we tried him for crimes he didn't commit. And we took him and put him on a cross We did what was absolutely heinous in the sight of a holy God. We took Jesus, who had no sin, and we put him on a grisly, rugged cross that the Romans had created for the vilest and the least of the criminals in all of the Roman Empire. And in that one singular moment, in that one act of selfless love, Notice what the writer of Hebrews says. He purified us. He made purification. If I was God, I would have killed you all. And I would have made sure you suffered in the process. Not Jesus. Not Jesus. Not the name above all names. He voluntarily laid down his life like a good friend. No greater love than this than a a man who lays down his life for a friend, Jesus said. He didn't just say it, brothers and sisters. He did it. He did it. And notice, now, the Hebrew people would have heard that and say, okay, we know what it's like to have sacrifices. We've killed many a lambs, many a rams, many animals along the way. They've been costly They've been without blemish. So how is this Jesus different? This Jesus was so righteous. This Jesus was so pure. This Jesus was so much without blemish that when he died on the cross, he was able to utter, it is finished. And what he was saying was, the sins of the world have been paid for. And he was able then to purify us. He could deal with it once and for all. Now, right away, the Hebrews would say, yeah, for a year. For a year. 
or until sins began to rise up to the nostrils of God. But then he's got to do it again and again. Notice what the phrase says. And then, after making purifications for sin, he sat down. His job was done. His task was over. His mission was completed. Brothers and sisters, when we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, it is accomplished. It is finished. No more sacrifice. No more ritual. No more good works. Nothing, nothing, nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Why? Because once he made purification for sin, he sat down and said, it's been taken care of. And so that is the Savior that we have. That is who we need to have come into our minds and in our hearts. But the writer goes on, one more thing he says. He says he powerfully sustains all things. That's what God does. He powerfully sustains all things through Jesus. Notice verse three. He upholds the universe by the power of his word. A couple truths here we want to walk away from. First of all, whatever power, dominion, authority that we give God in heaven, we have to give to Jesus. God says that while we attribute to God the creation of the world, notice God says, hey, hey, wait a minute. You guys got the press wrong here a little bit. You're giving me too much of the attention and not enough to Jesus, the Father says. He says, listen, yeah, I was there in the beginning. And yeah, I played a part in it. But he says right off the bat, Jesus created the world by the power of his word. Jesus over those six days, started putting things into existence. He was the one that spoke things into existence. And then as he put them into existence, he told the Father, don't worry about it, I'll take care of that. I'll watch over that. That solar system that nobody knows about, only you and me and the Holy Spirit know, Father, I'll take care of that as well. That little molecule that nobody else is aware of, I've got that covered. And what we begin to think is God or Jesus is this celestial janitor at our schools. Remember those janitors? God bless them. At the end of a day, those dumb kids would leave everything on the floor and the hallways were a mess. And that janitor would come in and push the broom and clean things up to get it ready for a new day. As important as those individuals are, that's not what Jesus is doing. Jesus doesn't come in and clean up the messes. This is very important. Jesus controls it and knows where the messes are beforehand. So Jesus isn't like, man, these, these people, they, they really went crazy, and now we got to come and clean it up. Jesus is in control of it from the get-go. And so why is this so important for this Hebrew audience? Why is it so important for us today? Because we live in a world like the Hebrews did in the first century, where life is messy, where life is difficult, where we wonder if we're going to make it through, where the world's throwing everything at us. And what the author wants to say is, listen, Jesus is in control. Jesus is in control. So go back to that molecule. There's not a renegade molecule in your body or in all of creation that God's not aware of. He's aware of it. He put it there. He's maintaining it. He's upholding it. And listen, that's really important when the doctor says to you that you've got cancer in your body. God knows it. And God's there, and God's going to use it to make you more like his son, Jesus. What about the political unrest? What about the pandemic? What about all these concerns, all of these issues? We've got a God who is omnipotent. This Jesus is in control of all things. So there is not one hair out of place on your head. Ha, ha, ha. There's not one hair hair out of place on your head. There is not one detail that is outside of the purview of God through Jesus Christ. He maintains, he upholds all things. We've got to grab a hold of that truth in a crazy, out of control, from a human perspective, world. So let me ask you this as we close. What do we do with all of this? Abraham Kuyper said, there's not one square inch of all of creation of which Jesus doesn't cry out, this is mine, this belongs to me. 
When we say that Jesus sustains all things, we say that when our world is out of control. But can I just stop you for a moment and tell you that when world, the world is in control, we like to have our hands on it? And what Jesus is saying, no, that's mine. The home you live in, mine. The kids you have, mine. The car you drive, mine. The job you work at, mine. The money in the bank account, mine. Everything's mine. And our job as managers is to seek Jesus' will for those things. What am I to do with these things that you've given me? Because you are the upholder and sustainer of all things. The writer of Hebrews starts out by giving us three truths that come with three questions. And this is how I want to bring all this to a head. God is speaking through Jesus. Are you listening to him? The book of Hebrews is going to say that the Hebrew Christians were doing a bad job of hearing the word of God and heeding the word of God. And we need to do a better job of hearing and heeding. Why? Because the word of God is sharper than any double-edged sword. It's living. It's active. Are you in it? Are you listening to it? Are you heeding it? Second, if God is exclusively saving humanity through Jesus Christ, are you believing in him? Are you believing? That is, have you put your faith and hope and trust in this Jesus who's greater than the prophets, who next week we'll hear is greater than the angels? This Jesus isn't just a good teacher. This Jesus is the alpha and omega, the beginning and the end. And he demands, listen to me, he demands that you put your faith and trust in him because if you don't, listen very carefully, because he's the greatest of all time, he has the right to consign you to an eternity in hell. And so are you believing in him? Are you putting your faith and trust and turning to him and saying, God, I'm not the greatest of all time. You and you alone are. Are you believing that? And finally, if God is sustaining all things through Christ, are you resting in him? When life gets difficult, when life seems out of control, When you feel like giving up and giving in as these Hebrew Christians did, are you resting in the knowledge that God is in control through Jesus? And he's got you covered. And he's watching out for you. And he who began a good work is faithful to see you to completion. That is why later in this letter, the author is going to say, hey, Christian, fix your eyes on Jesus. Put your eyes on him. He's the author and he's the perfecter of your faith who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame. And remember what it says in chapter 11 about this Jesus, or chapter 12 about Jesus. Scorned its shame, just like it said in verse three, and now sits at the right hand of the throne of God. Brothers and sisters, listen, the verdict is in. Jesus is the greatest Jesus is the one we need to place all our hope and trust in. Jesus is the one who deserves all of the praise, all of the glory, all of the adulation. He deserves all of our worship. As followers of him, the only thing we have to do is not work for our salvation anymore, but praise him for the salvation he gives. Amen? And when, yeah. And when he does that, our only response is to cry out, Jesus Messiah. Name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel. That's how we're going to end this service today. And I want you to sing it out like you believe it because that is our only response to the Jesus of Hebrews 1, 1 through 4. Let's stand and let's pray together. (laughs) Father God, we come before you and we thank you for Hebrews chapter 1. And as our worship team comes forward, Lord, I'm going to ask that we would utter words that our world hates. That we are going to utter words that scares the daylights out of the devil. The only words that bring us hope. The only words that bring us peace. The only words that bring us joy. The only words that bring us confidence and endurance. Jesus, the most excellent of names, is the name above all names. Thank you for being our Messiah. Thank you for being our Redeemer. Thank you for being our Savior. Thank you for being our Lord. 
And now, Lord, let us listen. And now, Lord, let us believe. And now, Lord, let us rest in the truth of the name that is above every name. And it's in that name, Jesus, that we give you our lives and we give you this prayer. Amen.